Fishing is a cure. Fishing on a paddleboard is another cure. Just paddleboarding is a cure, or at least is a mo modality towards health and well-being. You know, that, get, that gets guys moving in the right direction. And once guys are moving in the right direction, especially in the military community and in, and in the first responder community, these are folks that have volunteered to serve selflessly for others. They are folks that are that are going to do whatever it takes to you know to to accomplish a mission. And if you give them the tools to or the you know any sort of mechanism, if you say, hey, this is a path back to better health, whether that's mental health or physical health, they're going to at least try. And sadly, instead of trying a, a modality like this, like even just fishing, man. That, that instead we automatically default to some drugs and that just becomes this endless you know spiral downhill from there you know so we can do better we got to do better i don't i don't think the uh the pharmaceutical community is you know the medical community is doing us any favors by putting band-aids on this stuff and uh, it's obviously not working and uh we, we got to do something different I'm Josh Collins, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. That was Josh Collins. He was talking about his 2,742-mile paddleboard trip from Texas to the Statue of Liberty. Josh Collins is a veteran that has a really extensive resume. I'm going to read you some of this because I don't want to get any of it wrong. The underlying story behind this venture lies in FF's SFC, Josh Collins' personal struggle with TBI and PTSD. He is a special operations combat veteran with multiple rotations to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Bosnia, along with numerous other deployments around the globe in support of the war on terror. Moreover, Josh is a wounded warrior with four documented traumatic brain injuries with loss of consciousness from explosive blasts, two by parachute landing falls, and one more from combatives training. He retired out of 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, Delta Force, in 2008 of December. Josh continued to support the military as a contractor both stateside and abroad, but it was while leading a, tr a training exercise in 2013 that he sustained the final major concussion, complete with a fractured nose, rib, and cervical spine compressions that dropped him over the edge. Driving on with a doctor's prescribed medication, but also self-medicating with alcohol, he reached the limits of his ability to function. He went from there to really bouncing back. He tells a story of how this all happened, the struggles that he faced when he returned, and really the peace that he found by stepping onto a paddleboard and then realizing that he could do something bigger. He could bring awareness to his own PTSD and that of so many of our combat uh, veterans when they come back and they have, uh, they have serious struggles. And Josh, Josh tells an incredible story, not only of his own struggle and eventually overcoming and, and regaining his health through the use of the paddleboard and this, this long 2,742 mile journey, but also how he thinks that we can, you know, kind of as a country or and personally, each of us can help those who are suffering with PTSD and, and how he sees a road to recovery through diet and exercise and some sort of challenging journey like he took that brought him back to us. I want to thank Josh so much for telling his story on the podcast. This is one of the most meaningful episodes that I think I've ever done. And really, really, really want to extend my gratitude to him for coming on, mostly for, for all of his service and everything that he gave to this country, but also for coming on to the podcast and telling his story. And it was, it was really, it was really something, man. I hope you enjoy this one. I certainly did. Josh Collins, man, what a, what a legend and what a journey back to health. So hope you enjoy this one with Josh Collins. Josh, man, thanks for sitting down. I appreciate it. 
I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. I've done a little bit of research, but man, you, I know you have so much more to tell. How's everything going? It's going really well. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. I've read a lot about you and seen all your work and it's uh, pretty amazing. And this whole other side of stand up paddleboarding plus fishing, you know, is something that a lot of people don't understand or know about. Yeah. Well, you've taken it in a lot of different directions beyond just the stand up paddleboarding and fishing. And, you know, I know a little bit about your story, but in order to, to let everybody else know, I'd really like to kind of go back to the very beginning, like before you were in the military and everything, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Miami and then I, I kind of summered in Effingham, Illinois and out on uh, one grandpa's farm and another grandpa's lake house. And so I really had the best of both worlds, the city and, and the farm life growing up, grew up fishing, hunting, you know, working on the farm. And then, um, nine months out of the year, I'd, I'd be at home, you know, back home in the city and, uh, enjoying the, the big city life. So it was a big great, city life great of, way to, of Miami. Yeah. 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 Cool. And were, were you able to like growing up, were you on the, on the water around Miami, Biscayne Bay and all that? Yeah. A lot on the water. We didn't have a boat. What we did have is we were probably about five miles from the water and a lot of us, there was a, a place called Chicken Key. It was tiny little, tiny little island that we would roll out to. It's kind of funny because later on, I, I when I was doing that big to New York paddle, I mm -hmm. actually stopped at the key and I saw all these signs that said, this is a national preserve. You cannot come on here, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and, and I thought, the first thing I thought was, I wonder if those have always been there. <laughs> but you know, when you're a kid, when you're a kid, those signs don't matter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't matter. Later, later they tend to um, have repercussions. As a kid, they just shoo you off and tell you, yeah, you're not supposed exactly. to be here later. Later, they, they call did. the cops. <laughs> yeah, and that's why, and then looking back, that's why I recall being shooed off on, on uh, multiple occasions, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and just not, uh, not understanding why, you know, okay, all right, we'll come yeah. back later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what led you to the military? Something I always wanted to do. My grandfather was a, a Marine. I found out after he... He passed away. He had five beach campaigns, Pacific Theater. One of them was Iwo Jima. And in, this was something nobody, literally no one knew about, no one talked about. I, I got his flag and his service record at his funeral. I was 12 years old. He coincidentally, um, when he let me buy my first, my grandfather allowed me to buy my first rifle. Uh, I was probably about seven or eight to go hunting. And his buddy who had served with him said, you gotta, you gotta swear to your grandfather, you're not going to become a Marine. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought to myself at the time that, that, uh, well, that, that's all I'm, that's all I'm living for. You know, I'm, I'm buying this rifle so I can be a Marine sniper one day and on and on and on. And so I, I just asked, well, can I join the army? And they kind of looked at each other and they said, yeah, we don't see why not. So <laughs> I don't know what kind of experience that he had, you know, obviously it wasn't a, you know, it was probably you know, pretty difficult, totally different generation, didn't talk about stuff back then, you know, but he was such an amazing grandfather and father to my dad. And I knew then, you know, that's, that's all I ever wanted to do. And, um, and I joined up when I was, I think it was 19. Um, I had dropped out of high school, uh, at 16 and I was just working. And then by the time I was 19, I said, this it's, it's time, you know, for me to fulfill that, that lifelong goal. And, that's all I ever wanted to do. And that's all I, uh, I really enjoyed so much. I just loved it. Never felt like I had to work a day in my life. Right. Now, eventually, you, uh, uh, and I hope that you're going to walk us through your, your military career, but you ended up at the highest level pretty much. Um, but in doing that, you were a ranger first. So when you go into the army, do you have your sights set on that to begin with? Or did that kind of materialize as your serving no I, I did i i wanted right from jump street i wanted to become a ranger because i didn't have a high school di diploma at the time this was so this was 1988 and at the time you know those uh enlistment requirements they kind of go back and forth of what they're accepting based on the numbers that they need and at the time you know you had to have a high school diploma to go to the range battalion and so i ended up going to the 82nd airborne division 
And then from there, you know, which was fantastic. It was amazing. And from there, I was on a recon detachment. And then very quickly, within my first five years, I went to selection for a special operations unit. And, you know, I spent the rest of my career, you know, the, the next 15 years in that special operations unit. I spent time in the Rangers I, at about the 12 year mark. I was a senior NCO. I was an E7. I was promotable to E8. And it had always been a goal of mine to become an officer. And I, uh, so I went to OCS, Officer Candidate School. From there, straight out of OCS, I went to First Ranger Battalion, which was sort of an anomaly because you, you really are required to have a, a first assignment as a lieutenant prior to going to, to the Rangers. But so I went to the, went to the Rangers. And then uh, next thing you know, um, you know, we're watching the towers fall and knowing that we were on our alert cycle and that we would be the first ones over to meet that threat. Wow. And at that point, you're Ranger, not, I read in your bio that you eventually served Delta. Is that correct? That's correct. So at this point, you're Ranger, not Delta yet? Right. No, I, you know, so as an enlisted guy, I was, I was there in Delta for about seven years. And that's where I went to, uh, left and went to OCS out of, which is, uh, you know, fairly uncommon. There's, you know, there's one or two guys that have done that. It's a really great place and really great place to work. And, and you do a lot of really cool stuff, obviously, but I just, uh, it had been a career goal. And in part, because, you know, the funny part of that is, I served under a really, in uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, I served under a really good lieutenant. He was awesome. You know, he had it, he had it together. And so I saw that and I wanted to be like him. His name was uh, John Newman, big old corn fed dude from uh, <laughs> Montana. You know, he was just, aw- he did it right. And then when we got back, we had this, this uh, second lieutenant that literally like ran around with a, like a chicken with his head cut off. and. I just thought, man, I don't want to go to combat with this guy. <laughs> and uh, I said, there's, there's, there ought to be a law, man. You know, this is not fair. You know, this guy's going to, you know, this is one of those guys that's just going to scream charge no matter what's going on, you know, without, without a second thought. And so that's where I made the decision, you know, very early on as a private that I was going to become an officer one day, that I was going to learn my trade, learn to do it well, learn everything I could and, and become an officer. And you know what? There's lots of great guys that come out of West Point, that come out of uh, college and ROTC. You know, I just felt that with with my path that I could give back the best if if at one point in time I could become an officer and be one of those leaders, have all that experience behind me. And and yeah. the guys, you know, the, the guys that I worked with in my platoon and in my company, you know, they, they appreciated that. They like that I had that that kind of experience and, you know, could bring some common sense to the to the table and not be some, you know, 22 year old college grad just screaming charge. Right. That's certainly, you know, as far as grooming a leader, I would I can't imagine that you could be in much better environment. Did you have a lot of mentors like the one that you you spoke about as you become an officer? Are you are you continuing your your kind of mentorship with other people around you that that you've thought highly of as well? Absolutely. Completely. You know, and that's, that's what it's all about. You know, I think, you know, on the, on the one side, you got to have that desire. You want to, you want to be, uh, you want to be a leader. You have that desire to excel. And then that then kind of allows others when they see that to, to want to help to mentor you, you know, so with your motivation, that, begets and that inspires other other motivation around you and and so you get folks that go yeah this this kid is going to go play so i'm going to mentor him so and we all see that you know you see the go-getters and you want to you want to help them out and you want to push them along so i had just some incredible incredible mentorship and and you know with literally with you know some names general flynn you know, some names that some people might cringe, some people might go, wow, General Thomas, he, General Thomas just resigned from, or just retired out of, out of SOCOM. He was the SOCOM commander. He was an incredible mentor. I worked for him three times, you know, and he's, he's literally the one that sent me to OCS, you know, and with some stern, uh, 
warnings. He sent me to OCS and he said, I want you to go to the 82nd Airborne Division for a year and then you'll come to the Ranger Regiment because you need to do that. You need to learn how to be an officer first before you come to the regiment, no matter how long you've been. And I was, you know, I would, I'd been in for 12 years at that time, seven years in their special operations and, you know, about five years in, you know, reconnaissance detachment and doing, doing these things. But he still said, you need to go learn how to be an officer because you're, how- you've been an NCO. How did you take that at that point in your career? I mean, it seems like you, you know, you pretty much, you know, 12 years in, you pretty much know the drill. And, and how did you take that suggestion? I took it at face value. At the time, it was Lieutenant Colonel Thomas. But, I, you know, I knew that, you know, he, he was a brilliant man, obviously, you know, then to be the SOCOM commander and, and through a lot of, uh, you know, so many things in the war on terror. The irony is I knew he was going to the Ranger Regiment and, uh, and I wanted to follow him. And that's exactly what I did. So when I went to OCS, this is kind of funny. The other, there's three Ranger Battalions, right? And so there's second and third battalion. Those battalion commanders said, we'll take Collins. Well, I was going to go do what he told me to do. And I was going to head to the 82nd. But when he found out that these other uh, battalion commanders had said, yeah, we'll, we'll just take Collins straight away. He said, no, 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 he's mine. Mm -hmm. And I got orders to first range battalion. You know, I said, oh, you changed your mind. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's cool. You know, Um, I was going to do what he said because he is that great of a leader. He was that, um, astounding of a, of a mentor. He was that amazing. And so my intentions were to do exactly what he, what he told me to do. Then it worked out, worked out exactly well, like you wanted, right? Yeah, it worked out. Yeah, it worked Good. out. And I went and I worked for, I worked for him in first range battalion. It was, it was a great time. So in this career that you had in just reading over, over your bio and getting, getting to your, your story, you're doing some really amazing stuff. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're surrounded by some really amazing people. That's not all, you know, roses. You, you ended up having several brain injuries, right? And that kind of leads us to, to the story that we're going to go into today. When did those start happening to you or, or around you? And how did you start handling those? first injuries that you were receiving yeah that that'll uh kind of begin to occur throughout my career you know we all get our we all get our bell rung and so what's a concussion man you get your bell rung get up all right shake it Mm -hmm. off then some of those you know some of those early on were, were exactly like that and i never really believed or thought that they would make that that big of a difference and so, and because I continued to drive on, you know, in any time that that occurred. So, um, I, I had, uh, a couple, you know, in, in, uh, combative, uh, exercise situations, you know, got my bell wrong, whether it was boxing gloves or, or, uh, you know, getting slammed to the ground. Um, I had a couple that were blast injuries, like in the shoot house, and then, so those were, these were very on early on. This was before Afghanistan or Iraq occurred. The first one in, in combat was I had my bell rung by an RPG, you know, detonated right over my head, and I mean, literally laid everybody out around me. My, you know, I had a, a couple of RTOs that they were all face down, and I just kind of closed my eyes and you know tucked my tucked my chin and absorbed it. But I knew, you know, at that moment, wow, you know, that 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 was a, a shock. You know, you see that flash, you know, like pow, like you've been punched in the face really, really hard or hit with a baseball bat. And uh, and then I could see on the guy's face is that, you know, they had all kind of had their bells, bells rung too. And I was laughing because they were all face down in the mud and I wasn't. I was like, come on, <laughs> let's go get up. <laughs> you know, and then you, and then you, you drive on. Um, it, it's not until... It's the accumulation of those, you know, so a, a traumatic brain injury can be that, that one time. And then let me go fast forward. Then I had two that were, 
the the straw that broke the camel's back. But at that moment, you know, so this is while I was serving at that moment, the, these were just, you know, drive on these, you know, so those seven, um, as seven with, with loss of consciousness that, you know, I was knocked out for a, a short period of time and kind of came to, and then, you know, shook it off and okay, let's go, you know, let's, let's, let's keep driving on. And then those are accumulative and, you know, those, those need, those have to be noted by the individual at least, you know, and hopefully they're, they're recorded in some way by, by the unit or organizations that they, those guys can get help. But the final two was after I got out of the, out of the military. And, uh, one was a, the, it was a training exercise. And, uh, so I got my bell rung and I went home and I'm, and I kind of stopped and I was taking a shower and I was looking in the mirror and one pupil was about the size of a, of a nickel and the other one was like pinpoint. Oh man. And, <laughs> and I just went, wow. You know, and I, and I knew something was wrong. I, I really felt really off, but I knew something was really wrong. And, uh, then my wife looked at it and we went to the hospital, got, got seen by the neurologist and, and it was a very, very serious concussion. And then about two days later, and this may have been like the first time that I had a seizure and I really didn't, I didn't know it. Uh, but I, I fell down a hill in, in my backyard and, and I kind of scorpioned over backwards and my son literally came down and carried me inside. He was 18 at the time, carried me inside, called the ambulance. And so this second one on top of the first one, two days later was really like kind of the catastrophic moment. Um, and it's because the first one, you know, we weren't doing the right things. I should have been, I should have been in bed. I shouldn't have been up moving around. And what so was the time the frame between the these two? One. Maybe I missed that. What was the time frame between the two? Oh, 48 hours. Oh, 48 gosh. hours. Okay. Yeah. So that, and that's kind of what the, the neuro, neuro, uh, neurologist went after immediately following me he said, look, when you, when you have a concussion on top of a concussion, it's, it's like a laceration on top of a con contusion on top of a broken bone. It just, it gets, it, it just compounds the problem. And, and so with that, you know, then we began to see the, you know, the devastating impact of that, uh, you know, both with cognitive issues and with behavioral issues and emotional issues, you know, immediately following. So, now, at this point in your story, is this when you're you're um, in Tampa and you're checking into so, the yeah, Tampa we, VA? Yeah, this is about yeah six months prior to this when when this happened and and uh, and again life took a, a catastrophic is the only is the only word you know. Um, but my wife would say it was just it was like unbelievable you know like uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. My kids just literally, <laughs> my kids would just run out of the room. You know, when I, when I came in, I, I became a completely emotionally, I became a completely different person. There's a word I learned called perseveration and that's stuck in, in set that's stuck in, in the moment. So maybe one of them, you know, maybe they got to literally, they got to be on a test and five days later, I'd still be talking about the B on the test and how could they do this? And, you know, what were they thinking? And they're not taking school seriously. And, you know, it's on to the point they'd look at me like, wow, dad, you know, you realize we've, we've talked about this every day this week, you know, and, but I couldn't remember. Um, to me, it would be as fresh as, you know, that, that hour. And, um, and so these, these were things that became extremely difficult in, our family life. And, you know, anytime I talk about it, I bring my wife to tears because, you know, it would, uh, maybe the dishes weren't done or something, or maybe the trash wasn't taken out. And I, I go off on my son, you know, the, the, the anger response. And these are the things that guys don't like to talk about when it comes to traumatic brain injury. We're happy to talk about the cognitive stuff. I can't remember this. I can't remember birthdays. I can't remember things. But the the real difficult stuff is the emotional stuff because that's sort of like a an attack on our control and not an attack on the brain injury. And it's because we don't understand completely the brain injury and that the brain injury has everything to do with the emotional control. You know, that that those are, are aspects that you kind of get 
frustrated and then that frustration and confusion turns to anger and that anger is, is then turns into rage and outburst and that rage and outburst you then come back and you get depressed about it and then you want to kill yourself because you're thinking i got to put this monster down this is horrible and, and at the same time um, it's a, are you it's being a, i'm sorry to interrupt you at the same time are you being prescribed drugs for this as well or, or normally, right. or people yeah, and that's, prescribe yeah. drugs? Right. And so anybody that goes to a doctor and they're having these emotional problems, naturally, there's there's medicine for that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, it's, and it leads to these anxiety, you know, issues and, and you know, that's, that's leading up to this, you know, because that's, you know, what we prescribe. And so we, we then prescribe this stuff to basically dumb down the emotions, which is essentially dumbing down the brain, which is like, you know, it's like pouring molasses over the, over, over the brain to just, you know, let's slow everything down. And with that, you know, we've got to get control of this thing. For me, the, the really, the telltale stuff that this was um, global was the sleep issues, you know, so I was, I began to act things out at night and because you know i i led this uh violent life my entire life you know my my wife was in jeopardy and she wasn't such an amazing such an amazing woman you know so one one night i one night you know she wakes up and i've I've got my hand around her throat and i'm choking her and you know she gets out of bed and and but i'm completely asleep and i have no recollection of it um, but you know, she's got bruise marks around, around her throat. And of course, so we, we go to the hospital to talk about it and they start going, Hmm, what do we need to do to basically subdue what, you know, what's going on here? Another night I, uh, and this was like, really like the, the biggest awakening for both of us is I literally, I, I, grabbed her by the hair and I need her in the head. And fortunately I, my knee hit her forehead and it knocked her out of bed. And, uh, and you can imagine, I have no recollection of, of all of this, you know, but we, we go to the hospital cause she's got a big bruise on her forehead. And, uh, and it's all because I'm, I'm taking all these meds, which are supposed to knock me out like an elephant tranquilizer, but they're not stopping these violent dreams that I'm having and I'm acting out these, these dreams. And so basically the, the medication even that they're giving me is, is just, it's not even working or that it's wearing off. You know, I've taken it for long enough that it's wearing off. So at that point in time, you know, you start, you know, as the, the soldier, you start feeling like, okay, I, I think it's time you guys just put me down, put me down or lock me up, you know, because I'm, I'm not, I'm not safe. I'm not safe even around my loved ones. And that was very, very scary. Uh, so scary. And, um, and obviously scary to my family and, and, and to me. And so, uh, with that, we knew that you know, I, I knew I needed to get help. This is where then, you know, so you go back to the doctor and you get more medication, you know, and they just, they just com- compound whatever meds that you're on. And this becomes the compounding effect of, of the medication. And just, you know, eventually it's all going to, it all begins to wear off or you get used to it in one way or the other, but it, it loses its effect. Um, and with that, then of course I began to add to that self medication, and that's alcohol, because it's not working, you know. So how do I, how do I put this this monster to bed, you know, for for lack of a better term? And the alcohol naturally that doesn't work. <laughs> that's not going to work, you know. But you're ju- you're just trying anything. I mean, the only alternative, Tom, is is uh, the only alternative is to take your life. You know, that, that kind of is where you get to, I am, I am this monster. Uh, I can't control myself. I'm a danger to others and myself. And so the responsible and logical and rational thing to do would be to go ahead and let's just end this. And that's a, that's not a, not a good place to be. And so my wife saw that. And when she saw that, she saw that inevitability, she 
reached out to uh, the SOCOM Care Coalition. That's Special Operations Command Care Coalition that that takes care of our special operations soldiers, that community. You know, within a day, they had a place for me up in the Tampa, down in the Tampa VA, in the Polytrauma Center, to begin uh, treatment for these traumatic brain injuries and for post-traumatic stress. Wow. Man. God, that's a hell of a story. And so when you when you get into this this uh, Tampa facility, are you does it take a little while to to start feeling better? I mean, obviously you're getting some better care and people that are that are a little bit more familiar probably with your with your situation or situations like yours. So I mean, are they what happens there? Do they change your your drugs? Do they get you off the drugs? Like what what happens? when you go to a more sophisticated place for your, for your situation? Right. Well, the first thing is, so I checked in on the 5th of May in 2014. And the first thing they, they ask you for is you, for three goals. So you got to have three goals going in there. My three goals were number one, I went off all the meds because I, I felt like the meds were just, you know, you're, you're talking at this point, anxiety, depression, pain, sleep and seizure medication and the combination of all those you know you you might as well i mean you're you're a zombie hmm. and so i, I said out and and then they they lose their effect over time so and you got to take more and more and more so I, I said i went off all the meds the second goal is i want my cognitive function back and that was both um analytically and and emotionally i want to get back to who i am i want i want me back you know, it's the loss of self with a brain injury that's the most difficult aspect. And then the final goal was I went off all the meds. <laughs> and, you know, and they said, okay, obviously that's important. I said, yeah, that's, that's everything. Because I, cause I, cause I, like, I feel like you guys are playing Tetris with my brain. You know, I, I just feel like, you know, it's never ending. You know, you're just adding, you're adding to the problem. And, uh, so you, you check in there. I spent three months there, great docs, you know, and they, you know, fantastic triage naturally, of course, they immediately say, well, we're also going to get rid of this alcohol. So you, they, you know, you, you eliminate all the, naturally you're not drinking in the hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. so you eliminate the alcohol aspect, they take off all the meds, they, you know, they do it in a very, um, safe environment. And then, then they slowly begin to introduce meds again, you know, that, because they feel like they need to. They feel like, well, you know, according to our research and what we've done with other patients and with mice, that, and because you do have this brain damage, we need to control this in some way to make sure that you continue to be safe to yourself and to others. And so they, they naturally begin to put you on the meds again. And it's crazy. You're like, stop, what are you doing? You know, so, and, but they're really cool. They're really, you know, coy and savvy with it, you know, like, ah, oh, this is good. It's just a little bit, you know, it's funny. It's kind of oh. like a, you know, a crack dealer, you know, just try it one time. I'll, I'll get the first yeah. round, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, so next thing you know, they've, they've replaced all the meds you were off with the new, with new medications, you know, even though you're there in this safe environment and you're off all the meds for, you know, a month or so. And then they slowly begin to replace these meds. So it's what they do. So, wow. um, but you know, I, I, I had a lot of a lot of great therapies there, you know, between the brain therapies and also a lot of orthopedic stuff that I hadn't had done. I had several surgeries done. My my, they finally they fused my neck. They did a lot of great stuff that that needed to be done. Uh, fixed my shoulder, you know, a lot of stuff that was causing me a lot of pain as well. Um, but then it was probably about three months after I was away from there. It was probably like December. Um, so I got out in August or so, August. September and it was probably like uh, maybe December that I I was sitting in my living room staring out the window and it was about 10 a.m. and I'd been up since five and I was in my and I of course had forgotten to take my morning pill cup and so my wife came out to give me my pill cup and I realized that I had been staring out the window for five hours <laughs> Wow, and, and the only thing missing was somebody to wipe the the drool from my chin in the corner of my mouth, and 
and and all I, I just had this premonition of like the nurse coming up at some point in my life, you know, at this point I'm like, I'm 45 years old and like, here's your, here's your shot, Mr. Collins, you know, and, and the nurse giving me a shot to, uh, to keep me sedated for the rest of the day. And I, and I just, I just looked at my wife. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it anymore. And, um, from that point on, we stopped, we slowly titrated off all of the medication and we told the doctors i said i'm not doing it and it was awesome it was the best thing of course it you know it was not awesome for the first two weeks but it was awesome thereafter you know so now alcohol free medication pharmaceutical med free and i began to look for what am i going to do with my life next and how can i help others wow through this this whole conundrum yeah, and so in 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 searching for that, where did that take you? Like you're you're kind of you're kind of almost at that point you're reinventing your life. You're like, okay, what do I have to offer? You have this tremendous uh, realm of experience that you've gathered, and and how did that lead you to what you're doing now? All right, and that was uh, so I got on a stand up paddleboard there in um, at the VA hospital for the first time. I'd never been on one, and because of all the balance issues. Uh, you know, I've got a, few, uh, a compressed cervical spine. My eyes are, I wear, I wear uh, prisms because one eye is rotated and off. So I've got double vision all the time. And my, my one ear is completely blown, 100% blown from blast. And the other is still about, eight, is about 80%. So I'm always moving on dry ground. So when I got on this paddleboard, the, the earth stood still. The horizon stood still because of the movement of the water under my feet. It was sort of like having sea legs, you know, for, for a sailor. So when, um, so I, that's where, uh, my wife had bought me a paddleboard after I got out of the hospital and I wanted to do something to help others and to raise awareness, you know, for this, for this plight. So I said, hey, I'm going to do this stand up paddleboard event. I want to, and I researched, you know, what had been done. Obviously, if you're going to raise awareness, you got to keep people's attention, you know, so you got to have some, a danger element you know, or a, a fascination element. And I says, I'm going to paddleboard from, from the whole East Coast. The East Coast have been done, but I'm going to do the Gulf and the East Coast. Break the world record. And, wow. um, and uh, but yet I'd only been on a paddleboard for like a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> so my you got big goals. freaking out. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, goals, if that's the mo- yeah, all of a sudden that's the most least. comfortable place that you've, you've been in quite some time. I could see how you would be like, well, I'm just going to just stay on this thing. Like the world stands yep. still for the first time ever. I'm just going to stay on this and might, right. while I'm doing it, I might as well go to New York. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and we eventually we eventually moved onto a boat for a short period of time, and uh, until my wife began to have, she began to get sea legs. You know, anytime she was just getting sick of it, you know, literally, you know, um, the movement, she just got tired of it. But uh, for me, I couldn't even tell when the boat was moving. You know, I was just in my happy place all the time. But she's so awesome to you know have done that even for a short period of time. But we're back on land now. Um, and as also the paddleboard has helped a lot, you know, in terms of, um, healing this, you know, my appropriate perception is literally adapted and changed, you know, as much time as I've spent on, on the board. And so, uh, you know, a lot of friends tried to talk me into doing something a little more down to earth. I mean, I couldn't, at the time I couldn't paddle a mile without being so exhausted that I would, you know, I'd be like bedridden for the weekend. I mean, literally I would lose my voice. You know, they, they were still rebuilding a lot of me be, from the brain injuries. And, and, uh, but the amazing thing with the veteran community and with, I think with the human community is that when I said, look, I don't want to do these pharmaceutical meds. I want to recover, uh, you know, in the best I can, I want to be the best I can be. And that may not be a complete return to who I was, and I want to give back. I want to be an example that others can can do this as well. Well, there's all kinds of organizations and doctors and folks that come out of the woodworks that say, we're going to support you. And, you know, just because, you know, you're, you are taking the steps forward. And, and so with that, 
there were many doctors that came out of the woodwork that said, we're going to, we're going to support you and, and um, we're going to follow you. We're going to provide whatever assistance that you need in order to accomplish this mission. And that was, that was amazing. So I had this incredible support crew that was going to, going to be behind me. But again, I couldn't paddle. Uh, when I started, I couldn't paddle a mile without total exhaustion, you know, for the, for days. Was that ever kind of discouraging? Like, am I just going to do this a mile at a time? Or like, did you just know from your previous, you know, athletic experience and, you know, I mean, as a ranger and a Delta force, you're, you're an elite athlete. So, I mean, you've overcome before many, many, many times, probably on a daily basis. Did, did you just kind of think, well, I'll, I'll get there or like what was going through your head at that point? when you're having such a hard time with, with uh, my, just a simple what was mile. Going through my he- yeah. What was going through my head was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and that, and that, and, uh, and in part, you know, there's like, well, maybe I'm just getting older. And I would say, no, nah, that's, that's crap. You know, I got lots of older buddies, you know, that are mm-hmm. still athletes. I learned about the, the body's endocrine system and that, you know, and that's in the, in the brain and the pituitary and, and the hypothalamus and that how these things, when they're damaged, you know, they, they control your hormones, your hormones control everything that you are. And so we started looking at doing some very natural hormone replacement therapy. And then we, we began to look at uh, diet. Um, I went on a ketogenic diet in order to oh, stop the seizures and, and to um, create an environment in my head that was, you know, with clarity. And uh, Did that I went on the you? ketogenic diet. Oh, absolutely. Completely. The ketogenic diet was the first antidote or cure for childhood epilepsy back in the 1920s until the first epileptic drugs came out in the 1930s. And then when that came out, people said, well, hey, we don't have to be on this keto diet anymore. We'll just take the epileptic epileptic Mm. drugs. Yeah. So uh, there were all these things that I began to do, you know, with with these docs that were looking at this from a, a very holistic standpoint and life standpoint. And that got me back into next thing you know. Uh, well, when I started, when I started the paddle in March, I guess it was March of 2015 or 2016. When I started that paddle, I, I couldn't, pa- I could barely get 20 miles. And, and, um, it, but and every day was just, uh, it was a struggle for life. I mean, I would end the day in like, like I would hit the beach and it would be all I could do to like make camp and collapse. You know, mm-hmm. I wouldn't even want to eat and just so sore. So in such pain, find a place to, to sleep and collapse. And then I'd wake up in the morning in complete and utter pain and, and realize that, okay, I'm got to do this all over again. You know, this is crazy. I'm never going to make it. That went on for probably the first 30 days until, you know, suddenly the, the paddle started kind of, sliding through the water a little easier. I began to go further and further and further. And then at the end of the day, I wouldn't be sore. And then in the morning I wouldn't be sore. And it was, uh, and then Tiny was following me. There was a, uh, this billionaire in, in Texas that when he realized that Tiny, the plan was Tiny was going to camp along the way. And he saw that and he said, that's crazy. And he put her in an RV <laughs> And it was, <laughs> he said, that's, that's nuts. She can't do that. We can't have, uh, you know, the spouse following along this thing. So he put her in an RV and his name is Randall Reed. He's an amazing guy. And w- when, um, you know, I guess it was about, at about the 35 day mark, you know, my body was just morphing into what was going to be required to complete this, this mission. And uh, I remember her saying, I, I came in the RV one when, when I took my shirt off. She said, oh, my God, your back is like going from your from your elbows to your waist, you know, and you got like shoulder, your shoulders are like, you know, bull, in, and uh, basically your body just adapts. Your body just basically with this emergency, emergency override. I think your brain is like launch the alert five. This guy's going to kill us. Yeah. You know, he's not going to yeah. stop. So. Yeah doing anything and everything possible. And so my body adapted. Next thing you know, I was doing 40 miles a day. And now, as, a- your, as your body's adapting, and how's your brain a- a- adapting to this? Because, I mean, I don't know. I, I tend to think that the two are deeply connected, more so than conventional medicine might 
might give it credit for, but I, I'm interested to know, like, as you're, you know, well, obviously when your body's feeling better, the paddle's feeling a little lighter, it's going through the water a little better. You, you probably are in a little lighter mood and you're thinking maybe I can, yeah, I'm going to be able to do this, but how was it, you know, as far as your, your brain injuries go and, and, you know, you were saying, you know, like brain fog and stuff like that. And then you're on this ketogenic diet and now you're probably eating even less. And then there's intense exercise throughout the day. At this point, how are you feeling? Yeah. And that was one of the things that was, you know, just ultra amazing. And that is, you know, people would ask me, what do you think about all day? And I would say, I would think about the next paddle stroke. And so on one ask, there, aspect, there is this just being in the moment, you know, just slowing the mind down. And with that, you know, there's kind of this, you know, for lack of a better term, this, this Zen healing that's taking place. You're, you're literally just kind of allowing everything to slow down and the neural pathways to just start connecting again. And so that was, that was something that was fantastic. At the same time, I'm also having to navigate. I'm having to make very, very critical decisions. You know, do I cross this 10 mile bay? You know, at this right now, the wind is out of whatever direction, there's a storm coming, whatever, you know, and having to make these very important decisions because they were often life or death sometimes. So with that, you're you're also exercising your your mind to the point that you're forcing your brain to work like it needs to work again. And I think that was one of the, you know, I had a, I had uh, one uh, particular neurologist that was following me. He's, well, he's a phenomenal neurologist and he's, and he would basically, as I was, I was writing or I was doing these video uh, updates every day. Um, by about the second, third month, he'd say, Josh, man, we're, we're seeing it. We're seeing the clarity again, you know, you are in your you're thought, writing, in your writing better. Right. You, yeah. You're writing, your videos are, are becoming more concise and clear. And, and that because of the extreme environment, you know, what you've been through is an extreme event and you've done this damage over time and, and it's extreme. And so what better way to heal it than, than this extreme environment of need and necessity, you know, that, that your body has to adapt, your brain has to adapt to survive, you know, and, and I think that that's the most critical part. And I would, obviously we can't die, we can't diagnose and, and, prescribe someone to go walk the Appalachian Trail by themselves after some sort of significant physical or or emotional traumatic event. But to me that that would be the best way to heal. You know, in right. in and, 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 and terms of your body coming back to itself. Yeah. And you see that. Like the Appalachian Trail is a very good example that you see people uh that are suffering from from similar situations, PTSD, they go on this solo long hike. And I was going to ask you that, like how much of, of your significant improvement do you think was the fact that you were by yourself? You, there was no one else to rely on. And you're talking about connecting these neural pathways and thinking again, like you're, you're supposed to, and your brain's working. When you said that, I was kind of thinking, well, you know, and you mentioned the Appalachian trail too. And I know of some other stories where people are just, just go by themselves. And, and it just seems like maybe that could even help even more. Like you're out there, there's no one to rely on and you need to make all these decisions yourself. And then it's just, you know, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. Like you said, like one paddle stroke at a time. And you're just thinking about those things rather than, you know, relying on anyone else for really for anything. Did that. Right. And that's, uh, necessity uh, is the mother of of invention so that necessity is is the mother of healing in this extreme environment as well and that's where i I think it's most important to to isolate um naturally i mean i mean this is this is josh and tom talking about this and there's (laughs) Probably some PhD or doctor out oh, there going. You oh, guys we're, know killing what <laughs> we're killing them. Yeah, them. we're killing them. You know, but but going. Look, dude. You know, when it comes down to it, 
you're 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 gonna survive. You might cry for a while. It might really suck for a while. You might, but when you finally wake up, you know whether it's in the middle of the night or that next morning, the sun comes up and you realize that okay. All there is to this is, this is me. No, There's no amount of tears. There's no amount of bitching, moaning, complaining that's going to get this done. This is me. And it's time to go. You know, I can't lay here and die. It's time. It's go time. And with that, I believe that not only does your mind respond, but your body responds. And your body says, this is, and this has been proven over and over again with extreme events guys that row oceans and this is how i learned about this guys that row the atlantic or you know there was a guy named john beden at 61 he rode the pacific ocean mainland to mainland california to australia wow. over five months and and i was in contact with him during his during his trip and watching his how at the 30-day mark just like me his body adapted and suddenly the paddles, the oars were, were moving more f- smoothly and easily through the water. How, you know, over time, the, the mind just adapts to the situation. The body adapts, the mind adapts. And next thing you know, you're overcoming and you're, and you're getting through it. And you're getting through it without the aid of, of medicine, without the aid of um, supplements, or without the aid of anything other than this is what must be done in order to, to survive. And it just says a lot about uh, one the human being and who we are and, and how adaptable we are. Um, but it also says, you know, that, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, you know, doctors today, they'll, they'll say, oh, no one should be in pain. So we're going to prescribe these pain meds. But you kind of think back to, man, how did we deal with this in 1942? You know, we didn't have Percocet. We didn't have we didn't have this stuff. You know, mm-hmm. um, guys just sucked it up. You know, and 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 pain was a part of life, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. It's okay. You know, but we're not doing something that masks it that also, but then causes some greater detriment to our brain, but, which is obviously more important than anything else. Yeah, and you just see it so often. You know, people that uh, have a physical job of some sort, whether they're digging a ditch or, or putting stuff on a shelf or, or, you know, you know, a special operations warrior or some sort of, you know, the athletes tend to know how to deal with their body, but people get these injuries, you know, and it's, it's something that could, you know, an athlete could probably work it out and be back to training in a week or so, but certain individuals get prescribed medication and, and they get hooked on it like right away. It's not hard to do. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they don't yeah. have a job and, and they go down this this terrible rabbit hole of of just one thing leading to another and compounding upon this one injury that, you know, they didn't know how to deal with. And and in some cases, it's significant. It's a very significant injury. You know, you hurt your back. We wouldn't wish that on anybody. A, a hurt back is a terrible, terrible thing. But, you know, when you pile on the drugs, that can lead to you know, lots of bad things happening after that. Right. So on your, on your journey, you, you start feeling better at, uh, at 30 days. And now you're, you kind of think at 30 day mark, where does that put you, you know, leaving from Texas and now you're obviously well into Florida. Where do you remember where you were at, like around the 30 day mark? Yeah, I was, I was like a 30 day, 35, 36. I was at the panhandle. And we did a rally there, and um, that was the, the the first big rally, and it was in uh, Pensacola, I think. And it was with my sponsor, Boat Boards, at the time, and Boat Boat Stand Up Paddle Boards, and you know, it was, and that, and it just kind of was was this, oh, man, I can do this, you know. And up until up until then, I wasn't sure. Uh, so you know, my first thirty five, thirty six days, I was like, I don't know, you know, we'll see, and. You know, I'm just going to keep on one paddle stroke at a time. And then after that, I was like, I, I can do this. And then uh, heading across, you know, the the Gulf Coast is very sparse in terms of connectivity with, with the land. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't see Tiny for, you know, it would be like every three or four days we would link up again. I would camp along the way um, until we got around, um, you know, down in southwest Florida, Marco Island. I tried to go all the way across Florida Bay. I tried to do 100 miles across to Key West in one shot, and I got hit by some weather and uh, ended up getting get, got picked up by a safety boat. 
they took me to Key Largo. I went hypothermic. It was it was ugly, and uh, you know, but it was like okay, uh, yeah, yeah, you're you're not you're still a human being. You know, you 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 can't paddle through everything the ocean throws at you. And then from there, once on the East Coast, man, I just had a great, had a phenomenal time all the way to Virginia Beach. And Virginia Beach, I turned left and I went up the Potomac. I paddled upstream, did about 205 miles in five days, got to D.C., did a rally there. And then I, I turned around and I went up uh, up to go up the, down the Delaware. So um, going down the Delaware, this is where I kind of hit the wall again. You know, So this is like month four. And my, and I just ran out of, I ran out of steam and it was like, you know, at this point I'm like, you know, 2000 miles in <laughs> and my body just went, okay, we're done. And uh, <laughs> so then from there on out, you know, it just became a, a, a drag. And I remember crossing the Delaware and I was crossing it and we were crossing it with, and there was this kayaker that came out and paddled with me. And I got to talk to you about that, you know, the connection, um, because people started coming out to paddle with me very early on, you know, in Texas and that, or people came out in boats to paddle with me and that became everything. And then I realized that, um, and I would think to myself, man, I'm just out here. I'm just, you know, some average dude out here paddling on a stand up paddle board. Yeah. I'm doing this event, but man, there's guys that with bigger injuries that need more help than me. And you're coming out here to support me. And this is awesome. And then, so they would come up and they would always say the same thing. Is there anything you need today? It was like, I just kept hearing the same thing. My answer would always be water. Yeah, I need some water because <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> carry enough water. And, uh, but I thought, man, if, can you imagine there's 20 million veterans in the United States? There's 330 million Americans. If, if every American were to call a veteran once a month, then every veteran would get a phone call almost every day. People don't leave suicide notes that say, I'm just so sick of all these people <laughs> you know, calling me to check on me and, and how well I'm doing, you know? And, and so the, you know, the, the point is, is that this connection is the cure. It's not the meds. It's, it's this, it's, uh, naturally there's an appreciation. People are constantly stopping. Hey, thanks for your service. Got it. No, it's beyond that. It's, you know, how you doing, man? You know, everything going well, you know, what, what are you up to today? And that, that level of, of friendship is what guys miss the most out of, uh, out of the teams and out of their military service and getting connected again with their civilian community is all that's needed you know, to, to keep, uh, this, this mess of a suicide epidemic in the veteran community and, and to quell it. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. That connection, you know, some people I think are, you know, they, they might be afraid to do that. Like to say, thank you for your yeah. service, because it sounds kind of cliche at times that, yeah. you know, everybody says that, but, you know, to really mean it or, or to really, say, Hey man, you know, could you get a cup of coffee, you know, and sit down with someone that, uh, that, you know, is, is suffering, or maybe you don't know is suffering. That seems just fine. Right. That could be the biggest right. thing that you do. So as you conclude your 3,500 mile journey, you know, you, you, you conclude that at the Statue of Liberty. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you do that and you raise a bunch of money and awareness and, and things are, things are good. Now we fast forward, um, a few years from that and you've continued your life's work with veteran voyage 360, right? That's, that's right. what you're still working on. And so tell yep. me where, where that is now. What, what is it that you're doing now? How is that, how has your work continued? Yeah, well, we've, um, of course I've, I've, uh, continued to paddle and I've paddled, you know, a lot. The shorter distances, you know, there's like a 300 mile races here and there um, that I'll that'll go and paddle and paddle for an organization. You know, with Operation Phoenix, we raised about a quarter million dollars for the Task Force Dagger Foundation, and and since then, you know, we've raised money for uh, several other organizations. We did the race to Alaska last year 
which is 750 miles from uh, Washington State to Ketchikan, Alaska. Uh, I got hurt uh, about 461 miles in, and I got an infection in my knee that began to go septic, and uh, I had to get had to get pulled. Was hospitalized. That was tough. Um, it was tougher to leave it, you know, to leave it on the yeah. table than anything else. So, of course, I wanted to go back immediately this next year, but my wife is like. Yeah, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> so how um, how did that? What kind stressful. of injury was that? Like a cut or? Yeah, just uh, a just a tiny a tiny cut on my left knee. I began, and this happened. I left checkpoint two. You know, that's about four hundred miles from the finish. I made ground one one time, and I knelt on some barnacles and a little cut on my knee, oh. and didn't think anything of it. And then uh, the next night, I began to, I started having to urinate about every 15 minutes. And it was br- crazy. And, it, and the smell became like toxic. It was like, it smelled like a kidney. And, mm. and I was like, what's going on? And so I would, you know, I would drink a, I would drink a pint of water and I would, I would piss a quart. And I started getting really nervous about it. So I went through all of my water. And the next morning, I refilled my water at a waterfall. I kept on going, and then by the the next before it got dark again, you know, I I could I could barely stand, and when I made landfall, I got all my stuff up, and then I couldn't walk. We were talking about the connection and how people can how important that was to you and your recovery, and 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 what people can do to maintain that connection or to offer that connection to people with with PTSD. Yeah, but in in uh, the time that we got cut off, I was watching your uh, episode eleven, season fourteen on the paddleboard. Man, we got to talk, brother. Sweet. We got to get <laughs> well, We got to get you on the right board too. We got to get you paddling right. <laughs> yeah, I need some. I need some help. I definitely need some help. <laughs> I want to, uh, I really is, do want to do good. one you of those, uh, sneaking up on those snook, man. That was awesome. Yes. I do want to do one of those longer races. I think that it would be really cool. That's, that's actually one of the ways that we got hooked up here. Um, your buddy, Mike Dunlap was, uh, in contact with me and he was telling me about some of the races that he had done that sounded really awesome. Like I, I like the idea of, of those longer races, but I don't know, maybe we can, maybe we can hook up, we'll go fishing and, and you can, you can, uh, work on my paddling a little bit and you can work on my fishing man because i'll tell you what I, you know there's if i you know redfish blah, if i could eat a snook every night man i'd be in heaven for the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no doubt they they definitely eat well and um you know redfish can be good too if you uh if they're cooked right i guess um but yeah we'll do that we'll get together and do that for sure That'll be fun. Right on. We were talking about we were talking about that that connection and and it was uh, that these folks were coming out, you know, whether it was on a boat or on a paddleboard or on a kayak or on a canoe, whatever, it didn't matter. And and uh, that started happening very early on, especially when I was around, you know, populated areas. So I'd get out in the wilderness and nobody <laughs> nobody'd show up for days. But the support was just so amazing. And that's where I realized and kind of came up with this connection is the cure, man. Connection is the cure is that nobody kills themselves with people that are, you know, when people are reaching out and actively taking a part in their recovery and in their life and showing care and concern and making them feel like they've got a, you know, part of life and and part of a mission again. I, I think that, you know, that's been a theme for me ever since, you know, and, and just realizing that um, when you've got a mission, people people take an active part and that we need to pro- help to provide a mission for, for those guys that are out of the military and they're looking for their next thing to do or the next mission in life. And, you know, whatever it is, you know, just to become a part of something. How and do you, it, how it, do you it, suggest... It doesn't matter if it's basket weaving. Yeah, but is there a way that, like you say, we have to provide the mission? Like, what does that look like to you? That, so I, you know, there's there's two aspects I think are the biggest part of kind of the anxiety and depression guys feel, and that is, so they're a part of this thing that's much bigger than themselves, you know, national defense, or they've got this mission of you know this priority thing that they're doing, and then afterwards, you know, in terms of 
you know, the, I would say there's three reasons why guys look to, you know, in their own life. And that is one is they, they just can't find that next mountain to climb that next mission, that next, you know, part of their life that brings fulfillment. The other one is the PTS, you know, and whether that's, you know, for so post-traumatic stress and it becomes a disorder when it affects your life and it's a mobility disorder. It's a mobility disorder because it locks you down. You know, you don't want to go outside anymore because it's just, it's too overwhelming. You don't want to get in your car and drive. It's, it's too much. You know, the, every little stress, every little turn is a threat. You know, this is where guys, you know, are sitting with their backs against the wall in the restaurant, uh, kind of a thing, you know, and it's like, it, how do you overcome that? You know, well, uh, in part it's practice and, but in part they've got a, there's a, there's a bigger piece of that. But, uh, and then the other thing is the traumatic brain injury and that's where everything starts malfunctioning. I would ask the, you know, when the docs at the VA would start to ask me, did I think this was just post-traumatic stress or did I think this was related to the brain disorder? And I would say, I would say, I don't know, doc, I'm listening to a jukebox. The music is, the music is skipping. Is the record scratched? Or is the needle broken? The record mm -hmm. being like the input, like PTS, right. and the needle broken being the brain. So which is it? Because it's very easy for them to diagnose the PTS and then to apply drugs to it. But they also do the same thing with the traumatic brain injury. That, I think, is detrimental because we don't test those drugs on people with, with broken brains. You know, when the FDA is doing their, their testing, they don't say, yeah, we need, of these thousand test people, we need a hundred of them to have previous brain injuries, mm -hmm. right? right. <laughs> that, yeah. That's not happening. And so how do we know what this stuff is doing? You know, it's supposed to do this in a, in a normal brain. What's it doing in, a, in, a, in an abnormal brain? And so th this is where, you know, with all, the, with all this stuff going on, this is where it's just much better to find first these alternatives. You know, I wish these were the first options that, that were presented, but of course they're not, you know, but these are certainly the first options that everyone can know about and everyone can then recommend and everyone can, can be a part of to help guys that are, that are going through this stuff. It's certainly prevalent. And I think that as a society, we don't know, we don't know what, should be what what each individual should do like reaching out or providing this mission or inviting you know people in or or even what to say in so many situations and and we live in this culture now that people are so afraid of saying the wrong thing that i think a lot of times they just don't say anything which is is even yeah you know pushes people away even further that can't be a good thing and I can tell you, Tom, you know, um, as I'm sitting here, I've got your video playing in the background. If you were to give guys, whether it's with PTS or, or traumatic brain injury, and if, and if their their mobility is is to the point where they can get on a paddleboard and, you know, they've got a handhold and they can learn to paddleboard and they can learn to get out there and fish and get involved in something like that, you know, look, man, fishing is a cure. Fishing on a paddleboard is another cure. Just paddleboarding is a cure. And it, it or at least is a mo modality towards health and well being, you know, that, get, that gets guys moving in the right direction. And once guys are moving in the right direction, especially in the military community and in, and in the first responder community, you know, these are folks that have volunteered to serve selflessly for others. There are folks that are that are going to do whatever it takes to you know to to accomplish a mission. And if you give them the tools to, or the you know any sort of mechanism, if you say, "Hey, this is a path back to better health, whether that's mental health or physical health," they're going to at least try. Sadly, instead of trying a, a modality like this, like even just fishing, man. That that instead we automatically default to some drugs, you know, and that right. just becomes this endless, you know, spiral downhill from there, you know. So we can do better. We got to do better. I don't. I don't think the. Uh, 
the pharmaceutical community is, you know, the medical community is doing us any favors by putting band-aids on this stuff, you know, and right. uh, it's obviously not working and uh, we, we got to do something different. Yeah. Over the years, we've, we've worked with a few different organizations that do bring fishing to veterans. Um, there's Project Healing Waters, and then we worked with another one as well. And you could see that, man, it was, it was very effective. It was, it was very effective, right? even in just the yep. short times that we had, we had worked with them. But cool, man. So at this point in your life and, and what you've done so far is very admirable, but I tend to think that maybe you have larger goals. What, what does success look, for you, look like for you uh, now? And what do you think it looks like in the next 10 years? You know, I, I, I started this whole mission, you know, we started this conversation with, you know, when uh, you get on an airplane and they do the safety brief and, and the, the flight attendant says, if there's a sudden loss of cabin pressure, these masks are going to drop. And if there's someone in need of assistance next to you, make sure you put your own mask on before you put on, you assist somebody else, you know, and that's for first responders and for uh, infantry guys and rangers and special operators. That's, you know, contrary to what we think, we got to, got to save the day. You know, somebody needs help. I'm going to, I'm going to help them. But it's so important to put your own mask on first, or you're not going to be able to continue to help others. And so I realized that very early on. And, and fortunately, and, um, one of the biggest things in all of this has been a mission for me and also to get back to me. So that's one of the things is, you know, I want to be a, a productive contributing member of society. I want to be a business owner again one day. And, and uh, like I was before, I want to be doing these things, which, which at one point in time had to all stop because of the brain injury. And then at the same time, at this point, Tom, man, there's, you know, I meet so many people that say, thanks for what you're doing. And I was in this really bad place and I started following you and you changed my life. <laughs> and so with that, with that, it's kind of like, you got to go, man, I, I, I got to keep going in this, you know, when you start seeing the fruits of your labor and, uh, and again, for me, it's, it's ones and twos. I've never been looking for, you know, a hundred or a thousand people to be you know, going, Oh, you know, and write a book and <laughs> do a movie. You know, it's not about that. It's literally, it's the ones and twos that, that may, that, that fuel my fire every single day and make me go, yep, that was worth it. If there was just one, if there was just one that came off the ledge, that is enough for me right there. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, you know, you're, you have such a good story and you, you, you tell it so well, and you seem to really have a grasp of, of, you know, a solution as, and also at the same time, which I think is kind of unique. You have a, you have obviously a lot of experience to draw from that, you know, a lot of the doctors and, and health professionals don't, they, they truly have no way of knowing what someone like yourself or any of the first responders have been through. They're just trying to, to help but you seem to have such a good understanding of both sides that, you know, I think maybe you should, you should write something. You should go to appeal to the larger audience because as you appeal to the larger audience, then there's more of those ones and twos. You know, you, you get your message out there and you you have a, you have a, um, a better chance of reaching somebody that really needs it. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't totally write it off, man. I think that you, you could do that and you right could on. end up helping a lot more people, you know, but you know, things, th just things like this, like this podcast, you never know how many people are going to listen to this. And, and my wife is punching me in the arm all the time about that, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you have a good story and maybe, maybe, maybe that's one of the many gifts that you have. And, and one of the many ways that you can, you can choose to give back, but I don't know, you know, it's a, it's interesting. And if you spun it the right way with, with maybe some science, I could see it being incredibly helpful to, a, to a lot of people that aren't just, you know, special operators, other people that, that suffer right from, on. from traumatic brain injury. And, and maybe there's a path through physical, you know, physical exercise and, and, uh, the kind of things that, that you talked about that, uh, 
you know, can, can help more people. Cause that's obviously, right that's obviously success, you know, and, and, you know, you, you are, you're doing a good thing, you know, even if it starts as, gosh, I just have to, I just have to heal myself. Maybe that's the most important thing. And then you end up healing or helping to heal lots and lots of other people. I, I see it, man. I think that, I think it's terrific. I think what you're doing is, is awesome. I wish you all the best of luck. If people and, and I'd like to continue to talk to you more and more. I think I don't want to chew up all your time today. We'll have to get together and do that paddleboard fishing trip. I really want to do that. So we'll continue yes. to talk at, at that point. And then maybe we can do the, the first paddleboard podcast ever in the history of the world on the water as we're crossing some bay somewhere. If people want to follow you, if people want more information about you and, and uh, what you're doing, where would you send them? Oh, I'd send them to, uh, just on Facebook, Veteran Voyage 360. With every paddle I do, or you know, there's always uh, different areas. But I always go back to Veteran Voyage 360, and I've supported some other veterans on there, you know, doing doing their their journey. You know, the 360 kind of stands for coming back to civilian life, you know, and that return, you know. And, uh, yeah, but I, I, I do. I look forward to getting out there on a, on a paddleboard with you, man. And, uh and again, I've got, I got your video playing up in front of me, and it's just great. Uh, and I tell you what, you know, you you probably were. I don't know if you if you felt it at all, but man, when you're out there and you think you're doing nothing, but you get off that thing and you realize that you're moving the whole time. You know, it's a it's oh, yeah. a whole total body workout just standing. Oh, there's on that no thing, doubt about you know? it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. And then <laughs> so good. so much of what we were doing there is is so shallow that you're you're not only you're really not paddling, you kind of pushing across super shallow water which i'm yep. hoping that's why you think I, I can't paddle because i'm actually paddling across almost dry ground but yeah <laughs> right. i have a lot to learn i have a lot to learn on the paddle boarding i also want to hook you up with one of my friends that i did a podcast with earlier interesting guy because i saw on on one of your your things you had it looked like a, a boat like he did he did um his name's tim crockett i did a podcast with him he did that talisker whiskey row across the Atlantic yeah, recently yeah. and he was a special operations guy um, also and was doing doing that row for a similar cause to what you do so you guys would have a lot in common and um, he's a great guy I'd like yeah, to hook you up with him too yeah please you can listen do. to you yes. can listen to the podcast that I did with him if you want to um, but I'll, I'll definitely hook you guys up and uh, maybe we can do it'd be fun to do a, a podcast with both of you one day Awesome. As for today, man, God, thank you so much for telling your story. I really appreciate it. It's an amazing story. You're doing great work. And look forward to meeting you in person and, and getting out on the water. Right on. Thank you, Tom. It's been All awesome. Right, thank you. Thank you. See you. All right.